Oh, hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Cliff Sargent. It's a beautiful day here in Los Angeles, California. How y'all doing? Good to see ya. Got some awesome stuff for you today. Today I'm very happy to review Susan Sontag's, or Sontag's, or Sontag's, Sontag, Sontag. I've always said Sontag, but some people say Sontag. Sounds a little weird. Susan Sontag's Against Interpretation. Brilliant. It's taken me a couple of years. Well, you know, not, it hasn't taken me a couple of years. I've had the book for a couple of years, and I haven't been able to actually find the time to dedicate to... Okay, I was really lazy, and I just never finished it because I got distracted with other stuff. But, but, I love Susan Sontag's work. I love her. I think she's a fantastic, fantastic writer. Um, so... I'm very excited to finish this and share with you all of the wonderful gems inside. I'm very pleasantly reminded how much I love Sontag's style, which is very intellectual and refined, yet at the same time accessible and witty without condescension or pretension and, uh, you know, clever without uh, being cynical. Uh, it has a good deal of humor laced in with the, you know... It can walk the walk, right? And it's also strongly critical with the literary, philosophical, and cultural knowledge to back it up. So it's no wonder that her essays are addictive. I mean, they're a pleasure to read, you know, no matter how well or how poor they're going to hold up over time, which I think, you know, that that is a point I'd like to make, you know, they do hold up uh, disturbingly well. She was an excellent writer with excellent taste and excellent sensibility. And those three words are essentially what this book is composed out of. Writing, writers, you know, taste and sensibility, all falling under the umbrella of the idea of art. So these were written during the first half of the 1960s. And they reference so many wonderful filmmakers and musicians and painters and playwrights uh, and generally speaking artists of the era that half of the fun of reading a lot of these essays is just getting a glimpse into, you know, Susan's taste, into, into her references. Uh, and then looking them up and, you know, being able to experience all of that great stuff for yourself. I love doing that with, you know writers who I respect who, who do, uh, again, that whole intellectual stinginess thing really grates on me. It's like, well, I'm not going to tell you it moved me very well because then it might give away all my secrets or like whatever, I don't fucking know. But, uh, you know, when people ask me what's the stuff that's moved you the most or what's, you know, like what are your, what are the, the penultimate things that uh, you absolutely love, um, I tell them. Although, some of you guys have been asking me to do just a list of my favorite books and what have you, but that's, the, you know, I don't want to tell you all at once because then it kind of like loses its potency, you know? If you just hand everything over, then all of it kind of like sinks to this, you know, to, to the same, it doesn't have any impact when I tell you. I can't, I can't emphasize how much all of these artists or authors or musicians or filmmakers have influenced me all at once, one at a time, like she does very nicely in this collection. So I wanted to come across, like she does of course, uh, as being urgent, or having some sort of urgency, or being important, which that, you know, it is. Uh, so, her 20s and her 30s were mostly involved in academia where she was sort of, she was writing but she was also teaching philosophy on the side and she excelled quite well in all of her schooling of course, you know, to be expected with a mind like this. I mean, you'll get it from the very first essay, which is called, you know, it's the title essay, Against Interpretation. Um, she's on a plane all her own. And this is her, in my opinion, at her very best. She was also a novelist. She was also a filmmaker. Uh, I think she might have been a playwright. I don't know about that. Um, she, But her essays, absolutely, 100%, are just my favorite favorite of her writing. So she was in her early 30s when this collection was written. On Photography is also a collection of, or a book that was originally a collection of essays. 
that is kind of like the go-to recommendation. I think a lot of photography and art students were, at, that was sort of required reading where I went to school. Styles of Radical Will is another collection of essays, which includes my favorite of hers that I've ever read, which is called The Pornographic Imagination, which references my favorite book and all of its strengths. You can read it and you can guess which one that is. Um, anyways, I'd like to read several excerpts from this, this collection and then just read you, read you the entire title essay, which is not too long, maybe 10 or 12 pages. Um, which discusses essentially the manner, form, and rules, rules of interpreting this thing called art. So yeah, that's the first essay against interpretation. The second essay on style explores the notion of art as something useful or experiencing art as something that gives answers to major questions or posits some sort of didactic statement which I know you guys all love. What haunts all contemporary use of the notion of style is the putative opposition between form and content. How is one to exercise, exorcise, the feeling that style, which functions like the notion of form, subverts content? One thing seems certain. No affirmation of the organic relation between style and content will really carry conviction or guide critics who make this affirmation to the recasting of their specific discourse until the notion of content is put in its place. Most critics would agree that a work of art does not contain a certain amount of content or function, as in the case of architecture embellished by style. But few address themselves to the positive consequences of what they seem to have agreed to. What is content, or more precisely, what is left of the notion of content when we have transcended the antithesis of style, or form, and content? Part of the answer lies in the fact that for a work of art to have content is in itself a rather special stylistic convention. The great task which remains to critical theory is to examine in detail the formal function of subject matter. Until this function is acknowledged and properly explored, it is inevitable that critics will go on treating works of art as statements. Less so, of course, in those arts which are abstract or have go largely gone abstract, like music and painting and the dance. In these arts, the critics have not solved the problem. It has been taken from them. <laughs> of course, a work of art can be considered as a statement that is as the answer to a question, right? On the most elementary level, Goya's portrait of the Duke of Wellington may be examined as the answer to the question, well, what did Wellington look like? You know, Anna Karenina, Anna Karenina may be treated as an investigation you know, of the problems of love, marriage, and adultery, though the issue of the inadequacy of artistic representation of life has pretty much been abandoned in, for example, painting. Such adequacy continues to constitute a powerful standard of judgment in most appraisals of serious novels, plays, and films. At least since Diderot, the main tradition of criticism in all the arts appealing to such apparently dissimilar criteria as verisimilitude and moral correctness in effect treats the work of art as a statement being made in the form of a work of art. To treat works of art in this fashion is not wholly irrelevant, but it is obviously putting art to use for such purposes as inquiring into the history of ideas, diagnosing contemporary culture, or creating social solidarity. Such a treatment has little to do with what actually happens when a person possessing, possessing some training and aesthetic sensibility looks at a work of art appropriately. A work of art encountered as a work of art is an experience, not a statement or an answer to a question. Art is not only about something, it is something. A work of art is a thing in the world, not just a text or a commentary on the world. I'm not saying that a work of art creates a world which is entirely self-referring. Of course, works of art, with the important exception of music, refer to the real world, to our knowledge, to our experience, to our values. They present information and evaluations, but their distinctive feature is that they give rise not to conceptual knowledge, which is the distinctive feature of discursive or scientific knowledge, e.g. philosophy, sociology, psychology, history, but to something like an excitation, a phenomenon of commitment, judgment in a state of thraldom or captivation which is to say that the knowledge we gain through art is an experience of the form or style of knowing something rather than a knowledge of something, like a fact or a moral judgment in itself. I know that was a little long-winded, but I really like that passage.
So she also writes extensively on French literature, which I love, of course. You can just look at the reviews I've done on here you can, to tell, like, I'm a fucking Francophile. It's true. And there's a lot of references to Sartre and Sartre, Sartre whatever, and Camus, as well as some heavy criticism at both. Uh, but, you, you know. And uh, she's also very fond of the work of Jean Genet. Um, and, in fact, there was a great reference in this to Sartre, uh, talking about funeral rites by Jean Genet, which I reviewed a while ago, uh, admittedly not very well. And uh, this paragraph is better than my entire review. So I wanted to... Re so I wanted to redeem myself... So I wanted to try and redeem just a little bit of myself because I should have read this before so I could have stolen it to make myself look better. It's great because it just captures the attitudes of all three of these people, with those being Sontag, Sartre, and Genet, all at once in, in one paragraph. And um, it's a doozy. Sartre correctly describes Genet's spiritually most ambitious book, Funeral Rites, as a tremendous effort of transubstantiation. <laughs> a tremendous effort of transubstantiation. Fuck, that's a tough one. Sartre correctly describes Genet's spiritually most ambitious book, Funeral Rites, as a tremendous effort of transubstantiation. Genet relates how he transformed the whole world into the corpse of his dead lover, Jean de Carnin, and this young corpse into his own penis. The Marquis de Sade dreamt of extinguishing the fires of Etna with his sperm, Sartre observes. Genet's arrogant madness goes even further. He jerks off the universe. Jerking off the universe is perhaps what all philosophy, all abstract thought is about. An intense and not very sociable pleasure, which has to be repeated again and again. It is a rather good description, anyway, of Sartre's own phenomenology of consciousness. And certainly it is a perfectly fair description of what Genet is about. So. Moving on, The Death of Tragedy is an essay which discusses the strength and pessimism of the tragedy itself, as well as the seeming impossibility of a Christian tragedy due to that being a contradiction or, a, or basically an oxymoron, you know, because there's always hope in Christianity, whereas the tragedy is kind of like, its power lies in its hopelessness at the end, right? And this is a, this is a, a, a great, great little piece. I love this. So she's referencing this guy called Abel, which she says, A second Abel considerably oversimplifies and I think indeed misrepresents the vision of the world which is necessary for the writing of tragedies. He says, One cannot create tragedy without accepting some implacable values as true. Now the Western imagination has on the whole been liberal and skeptical. It has tended to regard, to regard all implacable values as false. This statement seems to me wrong and where it is not wrong, superficial. Abel is here perhaps too much under the influence of Hegel's analysis of tragedy and that of Hegel's popularizers. What are the implacable values of Homer? Honor, status, personal courage, the values of an aristocratic military class? But this is not what the Iliad is about. It would be more correct to say, as Simone Weil does, that the Iliad is as pure an example of the tragic vision as one can find. It is about the emptiness and arbitrariness of the world, the ultimate meaninglessness of all moral values and the terrifying rule of death and inhuman force. If the fate of Oedipus was represented and experienced as tragic, it is not because he or his audience believed in implacable values, but precisely because a crisis had overtaken those values. It is not the implacability of values which is de demonstrated by tragedy, but the implacability of the world. The story of Oedipus is tragedy insofar as it exhibits the brute opaqueness of the world, the collision of subjective intention with objective fate. After all, in the deepest sense, Oedipus is innocent. He is wronged by the gods, as he himself says in Oedipus at Colonus. Tragedy is a vision of nihilism, a heroic or ennobling vision of nihilism. Uh, there are exquisite reviews on the work of Robert Bresson in his films, which I have had kind of like a historically kind of a slightly contentious relationship with because, you know, I saw O Hazard Balthazar at age of 20 and I hated it. 
which is not very surprising when I reflect on it, you know, being 20 years old and, and watching a film like that. Um, but recently I'd begun to think about Diary of a Country Priest a lot and how beautiful of a film that was, and so I plan to revisit the works of Bresson in the, f the very near future. And, uh... As soon as possible, because I actually watched a *L'Humanité* by uh, Bruno Dumont, which is I think like a 1999 or 2000 film. Really, really great film with this actor who won the award at Cannes that year for the best actor, and he never did anything again. And it's a very simple story that takes place in a small French town about a girl who's raped and this detective, this very quiet and kind of like humble, you know, shy, introverted detective who's, who's confronted with this crime and he's, you know, working to try and solve it. Uh, brutal, beautiful, exquisite film that really takes its time with these gorgeous shots of the French countryside and uh, uh, just sits and there's just so little dialogue. It's brilliant. It's a wonderful film. Also, you know, there's a... Uh, I recently saw Pierre Le Fou from... Uh, Jean Godard over at the Cine family here in, uh, in, in uh, West Hollywood. Uh, they had like this 4K version of it, which was absolutely stunning. Really great film. Definitely worth rewatching a few times. But uh, sh there's a great uh, essay on Godard's Vivre sa vie, uh, My Life to Live, or however you want to say it, you know. Um, all, excellent film. One of his best, in my opinion. Uh, so yeah, excellent essays about excellent directors, um, and definitely important ones of that era, this being, you know, the first half of the 60s. There's an excellent one on the play of uh, Murat, Murat Saad, with uh, hmm. Artaud makes all sorts of references to Saad and Artaud. You know, and she's not hesitant to discuss politics and religion as well, and uh, she argues some points really beautifully. And, and you know, again, that, that's where things start to become disturbing. You wonder how much has, uh, has actually changed. Um, I kind of get the feeling not much. There's this great essay near the end called Piety Without Content. More common in our own generation, particularly in America, in the backwash of broken radical political enthusiasms, is a stance that can only be called religious fellow-traveling. This is a piety without content, a religiosity without either faith or observance. It includes, in differing measures, both nostalgia and relief. Nostalgia over the loss of the sense of sacredness, and relief that an intolerable burden has been lifted. The conviction that, was, that what befell the old faiths could not be avoided was held with a nagging sense of impoverishment. Unlike political fellow traveling, religious fellow traveling does not proceed from the attraction which a massive and increasingly successful idealism exercises, an attraction which is a powerfully felt at the same time that one cannot completely identify with the movement. Rather, religious fellow traveling proceeds from a sense of the weakness of religion. Knowing the good old cause is down, it seems superfluous to kick it. Modern religious fellow traveling is nourished on the awareness that the contemporary religious communities are on the defensive. Thus, to be anti-religious, like being a feminist, is old hat. Now one can afford to look on sympathetically and derive nourishment from whatever one can find to admire. Religions are converted into religion, as painting and sculpture of different periods and motives are converted into art. <laughs> For the modern post-religious man, the religious museum, like the world of the modern spectator of art, is without walls. He can pick and choose as he likes, and be committed to nothing except his own reverent spectatorship. God, she's just so good. She's so good. You know, when you study history and you read things like this, you just feel like everything it seems to be old news, and it's all just been, you know... One day I'll be that withered, cranky old man. Back in my day, we had the same shit, but we didn't whine about it. <laughs> so the collection ends with this delicious piece called One Culture and the New Sensibility. And again, new in this case means 1965. What we are getting at, what we are getting is not the demise of art, but a transformation of the function of art. Art which arose in human society as a magical religious operation and passed over into a technique for depicting and commenting on secular reality has in our own time arrogated itself a new to, to it arrogated to itself a new function. 
neither religious nor serving a secularized religious function nor merely secular or profane a notion which breaks down when it's opposite the religious or sacred becomes obsolescent art today is a new kind of instrument an instrument for modifying consciousness and organizing new modes of sensibility and the means for practicing art have been radically extended indeed in response to this new function more felt than clearly articulated artists have become self-conscious aestheticians continually challenging their means their materials their methods often the conquest and exploitation of new materials and methods drawn from the world of non-art for example from industrial technology from commercial processes and imagery from purely private and subjective fantasies and dreams seems to be the principal effort of many artists painters no longer feel themselves confined to canvas and paint but to employ hair photographs wax sand bicycle tires their own toothbrushes and socks musicians have reached beyond the sounds of the traditional instruments to use tampered instruments and usually on tape synthetic sounds and industrial noises all kinds of conventionally accepted boundaries have thereby been challenged not just the one between the scientific and the literary artistic cultures or the one between art and non art and non art but also many established distinctions within the world of culture itself that between form and content the frivolous and the serious and a favorite of literary intellectuals high and low culture the distinction between high and low or mass and popular culture is based partly on an evaluation of the difference between unique and mass produced objects in an era of mass technological reproduction the work of the serious artist had a special value simply because it was unique because it bore his personal individual signature the works of popular culture and even films were for a long time included in this category were seen as the works of popular culture and even films were for a long time included in this category were seen as having little value because they were manufactured objects bearing no individual stamp group concoctions made for under for undifferentiated group concoctions made for an undifferentiated audience but in the light of contemporary practice in the arts this distinction appears extremely shallow many of the serious works of art of recent decades have a decidedly impersonal character the work of art is reasserting its existence as object even as man as manufactured or mass produced object drawing on the popular arts rather than as individual personal expression yeah, a great work of art is never simply or even mainly a vehicle of ideas or moral sentiments. It is, first of all, an object modifying our consciousness and sensibility. Changing the composition, however slightly, of the, hum the humus that nourishes all specific ideas and sentiments. Sensations, feelings, the abstract forms and styles of sensibility count. It is to these that contemporary art addresses itself. The basic unit for contemporary art is not the idea but the analysis and the extension of sensations isn't that beautiful anyways i find her stuff incredibly fascinating and um one of my favorite thinkers of all time certainly and uh, a perfect reference for uh you know it, she's a perfect gateway drug for all sorts of other uh all sorts of other artists and filmmakers and musicians and poets and authors and playwrights and so on and so forth so susan sontag against interpretation absolutely 100 percent better than food hope you enjoy it and uh, i will see you guys next week always remember the gospel of john if you go home with somebody and they don't have books don't fuck them have a great day subscribe and donate on patreon if you can much appreciated see you guys next week ciao